So we're in this series where we've been talking about what it means to think like Jesus, act like Jesus, and our prayerful goal is that we would become, that we would be more and more like Jesus. So we spent about five weeks talking about how to think like Jesus. What did Jesus believe and how do his beliefs inform the way that we live and the way that we, we see the world that we live in? But now we're talking about how to act like Jesus. Because a lot of times we forget that Jesus did not just come. He He wasn't just incarnated. He wasn't just born. He didn't just die for our sins. He didn't just raise from the dead. Those are all absolutely critical and absolutely important. But he also lived in this world, interacted with other people. And in his life, in his ministry, in his teachings, we learn how we also ought to live. So we've been looking at how we act more like Jesus in the world that we live in. And today we're going to talk about this characteristic that we see exemplified in the life of Jesus so often. The theological word for it is single-mindedness. And so we're going to learn how to be single-minded. And some of you may be like, like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? It just means I'm not like two-faced or it means I just have one mind. Like, what does that mean? The word for our day and age would be that Jesus taught us how to be singularly focused on God and God's priorities for our life. Jesus was so focused on the Father, the Father's will, and what Jesus had come to do. He lived this missionally focused, undistracted life. Does anybody here struggle with being distracted? Anybody at all ever? You're just distracted. Like you're like, I'm distracted right now while you're talking, man. There's people moving. There's people talking. Like it's cold. It's hot. Like there's all these things distracting you. I'm distracted while I'm talking to you. Some of you whisper and I'm like, what are they whispering about? Do they not like me? Did I say something wrong? Some of you fall asleep, quite frankly, and that's okay. You work the night shift. I want you to come and find rest in the house of the Lord and rest in God's presence. It is a good thing. Some of you, you're thinking, right? I know, like, you're thinking about what the Lord is saying. You're in deep contemplation, and you may not realize this, but your contemplative face is a very confused face, right? So I'll look out, and you'll just... And like the spirit of God is speaking to you like, huh? But I'm like, did I just like start speaking another language? Like, what am I doing? Like, what's happening? What's going on? So we are distracted. I I suffer from this to the nth degree. So distracted. In our house, one of the worst punishments that my kids can get is actually going to timeout. And some of you are like, oh, that's just a weenie punishment. What's the big deal about going to timeout? Because we always forget them, right? Like they're, they go to timeout and then like somebody will come out like, can I come out of timeout now? I'm hungry. I haven't had dinner. Like, please. It's like, oh, sometimes they just fall asleep. Uh, that's a parenting hack, by the way, for some of you. Like, you know, send your kids a timeout. Maybe they fall asleep in there. And it's not bad. We have a very healthy home. Everything's fine. But sometimes we just... They're okay. I just want you to know we're distracted. Like, we tend to be distracted. It's a fight for us to focus because there's so many things fighting for our attention, right? And because there are so many things all the time fighting for our attention, pulling us in so many different directions, we have to fight to focus. Uh, We learned from Ted Lasso that we should have the mind of a goldfish, right? The mind of a goldfish. And his point is goldfish don't remember anything. So you can get over things quickly. You can move past offense quickly. But the problem is we have taken that very literally. And now like the attention span of the average adult in America is a little bit less than eight seconds, which is actually less than your local like in-home goldfish. We have taken that literally. We think like goldfish. We can't pay more. We can't pay attention longer than eight seconds. And I have a job where I got to get you to just try to listen to me for, you know, half an hour every week. So what do we do when our attention is just going all over the place? What does Jesus teach us? Look at this. Matthew chapter six, verse 31. When it comes to being single-minded, In following God and what he has called us to, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? And what shall we wear? See, we worry about all these things. All these things are pulling our attention in a lot of different directions. Jesus says, the pagans, those who don't believe, those who don't follow God, 
Those who are not singularly focused on God's priorities or his will for their life, all of these people are running after these things. Their attention is being pulled in all these directions. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. That part of the verse, we'll come back to it at the end. This is what I want to focus on. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. Seek God first. Seek God's priorities for your life first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. If we want to act like Jesus, we live with this single-mindedness, which means that I focus on God and I focus on his priorities for my life. That drives the way that I live, that drives the decisions that I make, that drives what I find to be most important in my life. So we're talking about distractions. We're talking about how to fight to focus on what God has called us to. What are distractions? What are distractions? It comes from this Latin word that came about around the 1590s. It's derived from there. But distractions, I thought it was so interesting. It really means this. It is a pulling apart, a pulling apart, a separating, a drawing of the mind in different directions. Think of distraction as like a tug of war in your mind. And and on the one hand, you have God, you have God's kingdom, you have God's priorities trying to move you towards a more flourishing, thriving, and beautiful life that has been laid out for you by the very creator of life, right? That's what we have on the one hand, pulling you in one direction. And then on the other hand, you got everything else in the entire world trying to pull you out of whack with where God is trying to take you. You have social media, you have politics, you have the news media, you have your job, you have your children, you have all of these things. You you have your own dating life, you've got your relationships, you got your friends, you got your bills, you got all kinds of stuff trying to pull you in another direction. Pull you out of step with what God has wanted to do and his priorities for your life. I shared this a few months ago. Uh, I've just been researching, studying, looking into the human soul so much in this season. I've just been fascinated with this idea of the soul. There's a writer named Dallas Willard, another writer named John Ortberg, who summed it up well for me, and I've been diving into this idea of, of our soul being the integration of these different parts of our humanity. So we have a body, we have a will, and we have a mind, a body, a will, and a mind. And a healthy, flourishing soul, we might call this inner peace, is when all those parts of our life come together, they are integrated, and they're moving in harmony with God and how God intended for creation to be. So do you see how this idea of being distracted how our attention is being pulled in all these different directions. Do you see how that disintegrates us? Have you ever experienced that? Your mind being pulled out of step. So you have a will. You have these good intentions. You leave every Sunday like, I'm going to serve the Lord this week. I'm going to live for the glory of God just like he said. I'm ready. Let's do it. And then you like go out on Monday and your mind just gets pulled in different directions, right? Sinful directions. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and then boom, it's over. Everything you learned on Sunday, out the door, right? It just happens that way. Or your body. Have you ever been like present in a room physically embodied with people that you love and you care about and God has given you the responsibility to take care of them and steward them and love them and give your life to them? You are there in body, but your mind is like in a whole different place. Your mind could be in a whole different continent, right? Like you are not there. You are disintegrated, pulled apart. And so God wants us to be together, not pulled apart, but this is what the enemy would do. In order to destroy you, in order to destroy your purpose, in order to destroy the ministry that God has called you to, the enemy would do whatever he can to distract you to the point of destruction. Because if the enemy cannot destroy you, he doesn't have to destroy you as long as he can distract you. See, at the very least, if you're distracted enough, you'll be neutralized from doing what God has called you to do. Like, you'll just be chasing after everything. Your attention goes every which way. You don't focus on what is important, and you'll just be ineffective in doing what God has called you to do. 
being the person that your family needs, being the person your community needs, your church needs, you'll be ineffective. But at worst, and I've seen this happen in so many people's lives, you can be distracted by so many things that you actually just end up destroying yourself. Like you end up self-sabotaging your own life, chasing after this, chasing after that. Maybe that's better. Maybe this will work out better. And over time, you have found yourself in a place of self-destruction. The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. So what do we do? What does it mean for us to be single-minded, to focus on God and his priorities for our life? There's a great event that takes place in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus gives us this picture of what it means to act like him. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha, everybody say Martha, Martha opened, see, I'm trying to get you to keep paying attention because you got eight seconds, so I got to make you, Martha opened her home to Jesus. It's a good thing. Jesus comes to town. Martha invites Jesus, invites the disciples. She opens her home. She's getting things ready for Jesus. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, this is just extra. This got nothing to do with my message, but I think this is important. So before I go on, the place where Mary is sitting, it is really important to us. Because throughout the Gospels, we see that this position, to be sitting at the rabbi's feet, listening to the rabbi's teaching, this is a position of discipleship. This is a position of spiritual formation. This is a position of spiritual development. And the reason it's important is because in the ancient world, up until like this moment, when Jesus is doing things like this, it would be unthinkable for a woman to be sitting in that position. For a woman to be learning, for a woman to be learning under a rabbi, for a woman to be discipled in the same way that men are discipled. So if someone comes and asks you at work, like, well, doesn't Jesus hate women and don't Christians hate women? Like, you need to point to passages like this that show, no, it was truly revolutionary the way Jesus saw people in his world, the way he treated them, the way he elevated the plight of those who were marginalized up until that point. It's incredible. So there's Mary. That's a whole different sermon, a whole different day. I just felt like saying that, right? So there's Mary. She's sitting at Jesus's feet. Martha has opened the home for him to come in. She's getting everything ready. And what do we read? But Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And it kind of makes sense when you look at that. I mean, I don't know if you've had like a celebrity in your home. I don't know if you've had a very important person or a famous person in your home. I think you would pull out all the stops to take care of them if your boss is coming over or something like that. It's like the most famous person who ever lived, right? Jesus is coming to Martha's home. She's invited him. She's opened the home. She wants everything to be perfect. She wants the table to be set just right. She wants to make sure the casserole comes out at the right time so that it's warm when Jesus eats. She's checking his cup. Jesus, do you need a refill? Need a little bit more wine? Peter, do you need more wine? I heard you have a temper. I really want to know, do you need a little bit more wine? Is everybody okay? I want to make sure the cobbler goes in the oven at the right time so that it's ready right in time for dessert. She wants everything to be perfect. Most scholars believe Martha's last name was Stuart, right? Like Martha wants everything to be just perfect. Right, I'm so glad you like that one. I've been, I've been working on that one all week. I appreciate it. Okay, <laughs> she wants everything to be perfect, perfect. And Jesus says, Martha, you are distracted by all these things. So look what she does in the second part of verse 40. She comes to Jesus. She comes to Jesus, and she says, Lord, don't you care that my lazy, rotten, useless sister is not doing anything? She has left me to do all the work. Jesus, tell her to help me. Tell her to help me. Anybody got a sibling in here? Like, this never changes, right? Like, if you have a sibling, this never changes. Look at these hands up over here, right? This never changes. I've got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. It's still like this, right? He'll come and be like, sissy's not helping me. She's not doing anything. He's pointing at, like, one fork. I'll be like, you've, you've cleared the entire table, bro. Just take that one fork 
to the kitchen. It's Sissy's fork, right? It's not my fork. I'll do everything, but I'm not going to do anything. Sissy's not helping me. This is Martha right now to Jesus. Jesus, Sissy's not helping me, right? Like, I need some help. Would you tell Mary to help me? Jesus responds. And throughout this series, as we've looked at the way that Jesus deals with people and the way he interacts with people and responds to people, I hope you've seen his compassion, his gentleness, his kindness, his love towards people. He says, Martha, Martha. And the the two Marthas I think is so important. I I think the first one is just like, Martha, I see you, right? I, I hear what you're saying. I know Man, you are working so hard, Martha. Yes, yes, I, I get it, I get it. Mary, mm, what are we gonna do, right? <laughs> Martha, and I think the second Martha is just like, Martha, take a breath. Peace, like, let's calm down. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one is needed. There's so many things that are fighting for your attention. You're getting pulled in a million different directions. You are in a tug of war. But Martha, there's just one thing that's important right now. There's just one thing that's important. Mary has chosen what is better. Everyone say better. She's chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Is anybody in this room Worried and upset about many things. <laughs> like right now, you probably are, right? Any of you watching it online, I wonder if you're worried and upset about many things. In some ways, it's just the culture that we live in. There's always a million things fighting for our attention. Parents, you're like, okay, I got to wake up. Okay, phone just dinged. What's going on? I got to check my social media just to make sure everything's okay. Kids got to get to school. Forgot about that. Let's get the kids to school. Clothes, food, done. Let's go. One kid's got to go to soccer. The other kid's got to go to basketball. Let's get them there. Guys, we got to eat food. How are we going to do it? Let's go to a drive-thru. We don't have time for that. There's like french fries on the floor. Eat them, right? Let's go there. When we get home, we'll eat. Just let's make it happen. Maybe you're in a different phase of life. Right? Maybe, maybe you're in that singlehood phase and you're just like, all right, I've got to go on a date because I don't want to be alone. I got to find, okay, I got to go hang out with my friends because I don't want all my friends to ditch me because I just avoided them. But work is crazy. How am I going to do this? I think my boss sent me an email. If I don't respond to this email, I'm going to look like a slacker. I'm not going to be able to get ahead. Like, I've got to do this even though it's midnight. And why is he sending me stuff at midnight? Okay. Like, you got to just make it happen. Running in a million directions. And now we've got the holidays coming, right? And, and we're making jokes about you don't need to decorate for the holidays till after Thanksgiving. And some of you are hearing that and you're laughing on the outside and you're just stressed out on the inside. Like, what are we going to do for Christmas? We got to decorate. When do we do it? I mean, isn't that the world we live in? Pulled in so many different directions, worried about so many things. I want you to notice this. Martha's not doing anything bad. Martha's not doing anything bad. In fact, everything she's doing is good. Everything she's doing is good. I think a lot of times hearing the story growing up, Martha would get a bad rap, right? Like, oh, Martha's the bad one. Like, Mary's listening to Jesus. She's so good. And Martha, oh, Martha. But now that I'm an adult, I'm kind of like, oh, man, thank God for people like Martha, right? Thank God. Martha's the reason we eat on time. Like, Martha's the reason the bills are paid. Martha's the reason we got a roof over our head. Thank God for people like Martha. Mary probably loves Jesus, but maybe does nothing, right? Like, she just shows up to dinner, and she doesn't bring nothing but, like, a smile and a hug. I'm Mary. I'm here. I'm ready to hear from Jesus. You need Martha's in your life. Don't miss that. She's not doing anything bad. She's not doing anything wrong. In fact, what she is doing is good, but good was not best. That's all Jesus says. You're doing something good. You're pulled in a million different directions. Your attention is going all these places. You're doing something good, but you haven't chosen what is best. My friends, so often the most difficult choices are not between good and bad. They're between good and best. And to be single-minded, focused on God, focused on God's priorities for your life means that you have to be in a place where the Spirit of God is leading you daily, where the wisdom that you have ascertained from God's Word is leading you daily to choose what is best. Not just what is good, because there's a lot of good stuff coming at you that's just trying to pull you in every direction. 
Jesus would say to you, you got to choose what is best. Well, how do we do it? A couple ways. How do we choose what is best? First of all, diminish the distractions in your life. Diminish the distractions in your life. Great passage, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. The context here is the Apostle Paul speaking to people about being single. And he is lifting up the merits of singleness. Because the Apostle Paul is like, listen, yeah, guys, you can get married. But if you get married, you're going to have a lot of stuff to worry about. right? You're going to be stressed about your family. You're going to be stressed about your wife. You're going to be stressed about taking care of everybody. you got a lot of stuff to worry about. He says, women, yeah, you can get married if you want to. And if God has called you to that, great. But when you get married, women, you got a lot of stuff to worry about. You're going to have a lot of stuff to stress about. You're going to be upset and worried over so many things. And so essentially he is like, maybe this is better, guys. Look what he's saying. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Right? Marriage is a good thing, right? Married people say yes quickly, right? Marriage is a good, <laughs> marriage is a good thing. It's a good thing. But Paul is like, maybe for some, it's not what helps them serve the Lord best. And for those, maybe it's better to be single, but be wholeheartedly focused on what God is calling you to do. That's the degree to which he is so serious about eliminate anything that distracts you from God's purpose and God's will in your life. A good thing, a good thing may not always be best. If you're already married, it is best you stay married, by the way. If you hear that point and you're like, huh, like, what is this? So that's the degree that Paul's willing to go to. That's the degree that he's willing to go to. Now, I need to ask you, I know we're taking that a little bit out of context, but how would you apply that in your life? If he's saying you do whatever you need to do to live your life without distraction from God's purpose and God's will, what do you need to do? What do you need to get out of your life? What do you need to have less of in your life? I'll give you the first answer. It's your phone, okay? I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't care who you are. It is probably your phone. Man, cell phones, smartphones, I'm assuming everybody has a smartphone. Let me tell you the amount of time that is going to this part of your life. Let me tell you the worry and upset that is happening in your life because of how much time you have devoted to your phone. The average American spends three and a half hours a day on their phone. This blew my mind. This blew my mind. Three and a half hours a day on their phone. Students, middle school students, high school students, college students, I know you're going to hate me by the time I'm done today. I'm sorry. I hope you have fantastic conversations at lunch with your parents. It's going to be fun for you. I'm a grown-up, so I don't have to do that, right? So three and a half hours a day on your phones. We interact with the phone, meaning we check it, we touch it, we pick it up about 60 times a day, 60 times a day. Have any of you ever had this happen where you don't even have your phone? You don't even have it with you, and like your pocket is buzzing, like you feel it like vibrating, and you're like, what is that? Like what is going on with me? Our phones have just become such a part of our lives. Americans total in the year 2021 spent a total of 3.8 trillion hours on their phones, on their phones. And here's something that I found interesting. We know that the usage of phones went up from 2019 to 2021. It, Oklahoma is the state where that number increased the second most, the second highest increase in phone usage from 2019 to 2021 is right here where we live. That went up 132.1%. So we're in this place where I feel like there's a good thing. Listen, a phone is a good thing. Don't hear me. I'm not like that. I'm, we're, not, we're not an Amish church, okay? So the phone is a good thing. It's a good thing. But the question is, is it the best thing? Are we making the best choices? Are we thinking through things in the best way? There's a study that I read from the University of Chicago. I don't have time to go into all the details. It's so fascinating. Talking about how the simple presence of your phone decreased people's cognitive ability. This is not even people who were checking their phones. This is just, you had people in two different groups, one where they would take a test one day, and they would leave their phone in another room, and they would go in and they would take a test. And the next day, you got to bring your phone with you. You didn't get to use it. You didn't get to look at it. You just put it down on the desk, and you took the test with your phone there. And people's cognitive abilities 
tanked just because they had their phones sitting next to them. And the reason scientists figured out is you, you have basically a limited amount, amount of attention. You have like an attention bucket and you get 100 units of attention in there. The mere presence of your phone, just the fact that it's around, a bunch of your attention units just go into it because you're like, I wonder what's going on in there. Like, I wonder if someone's commenting on my post. I wonder if someone's emailing me. I wonder if someone's trying to get a hold of me. I wonder if someone's texting me. I wonder why that person never texted me back. Like, what's that about? That was three years ago. Like, what do we do, you know? Your attention is going there to the point where your cognitive ability is dropping, okay? Can I just summarize? Like, I found out this week our phones are making us dumber. I mean, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So, distractions. What do we do? Get, this, get them out of your life. Get them out of your life. I'm not saying you got to get rid of your phone. Hold on. I'm not saying you got to get rid of your phone. But I'm asking you this. Can you monitor how much time you're spending on the phone? Can you think about, man, am I putting a lot of time into this? Am I falling into this three and a half hours a day bunch? In the times where I'm trying to pray, am I praying with this thing next to me? Is my attention going there? Because so much of our faith requires deep, contemplative, prolonged moments of being with God, being in God's presence, allowing the Spirit to deal with us. And if we're not able to focus in one direction for more than eight seconds, are we going to have a deep, contemplative Christian life? Yes or no? No. Okay. No. <laughs> it's so true. And I understand. I understand. That's challenging. But I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. It might not just be your phone. For some of you, it might be you just need to cancel your Netflix subscription. For some of you, it might be you've got to monitor how much time you spend watching sports, right? It's so easy, guys, right, to, to sit down on Saturday morning, and if the football is good enough, right, all of a sudden it's 11 p.m. on Saturday, and you're like, where are my kids? Like, what happened to them? Like, what's been going on? We've got to pay attention. We've got to pay attention. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to be harsh. I want you to experience a thriving, flourishing, incredible Christian life designed for us by the one who created it. And he says, if you find the things that are distracting you from his goodness, distracting you from his call, distracting you from his presence, are you willing to get those things out of your life? Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> All right. Diminished distractions. Secondly, focus on what is important. Focus on what is important. So Jesus says, Martha, you're worried about so many things. You're upset about so many things, but there's only one thing that's important. It's right in front of you. Jesus wants her to know I'm important. Focus on me. Keep your eyes on me. Don't look to the left or the right. Focus on me. We were at the park one time. And there's like this balance beam, but it's really thin. I don't know why it's there. Really thin. But my kids can just go right across it like no problem. They just walk across like it's nothing, right? So I'm like, yeah. Sorry, camera people. That was fast. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I can do that too. So I would try to get on this balance beam and I would try to walk. And I keep falling off like a dodo, right? Like what is going on? And I got to ask my kids, how do you guys go so fast? And as if it's just the simplest thing in the world, they're like, we just look ahead, right? We just look straight, I'm spending the whole time looking at the ground. They're just looking straight. Jesus is like, keep your eyes on me. Don't look to the left or the right. Don't look around. Keep your eyes on me and walk the walk of faith that I've called you to. We see it in Proverbs 4, verse 25. This is how Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all sideshow distractions. Watch your step and the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither right nor left. Leave evil in the dust. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Eliminate those things that take and steal your attention and move in the direction that God is calling you to move in, living for him and prioritizing his purposes. Right? We see this in the life of Peter. In Matthew 14, the disciples have to go ahead of Jesus. They're out on a boat. They're in the midst of a storm. Jesus needs to catch up with them quickly. He's like, how am I going to get to them? I got to get over there. What do I do? So Jesus starts walking on water. This is how he is, right? And so in the middle of a storm, Jesus is walking on water, comes to the boat, 
And the disciples are like terrified. Who is this ghost walking on the water? And Jesus knows they're terrified. So Matthew 14 says he calls out, guys, relax. It's me, Jesus. To which Peter responds, is that you, Jesus? Right? That's what he says. Right after Jesus says, it's me, Peter's like, is it Jesus? And then Peter says, let me come out there. Call me out there. So he gets out of the boat. He starts walking towards Jesus. And what does it say? He is walking on the water until he starts to look at the waves, until he starts to look at the wind, until he takes his eyes off Jesus. And then he starts to sink. And some of you in this room, that might be how you describe your life right now. I'm sinking, Jason. I just feel like I am sinking. I'm always overwhelmed. I always feel like I'm behind. I always feel like I cannot catch up. I always feel like I am less than. I always feel like I'm not measuring up. I always feel like I'm not good enough. I always feel like I'm chasing after the next thing and I'm chasing after something more and I feel like I'm chasing after something I cannot catch. I'm always discontent. I'm always unhappy. I feel like I am sinking. And maybe you've taken your eyes off of Jesus. And he's saying to you, like he said to Martha, hey, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. There's only one thing that is important, and you have to choose what is important. Martha defines success by what she would get. She's going to host a great party. She's going to have Jesus, a very important person in her home. She's going to go over the top in her hospitality, and she's going to get acceptance from her friends. She's going to get affirmation. She's going to get approval. She's going to impress other people. She's going to get that good feeling about, look, I did something good. She was so focused on what she would get that she didn't pay attention to what she could lose. And Jesus says, Mary has chosen something better. She's spending time with me. She's getting to know me. She's growing in me. And what she has chosen cannot be taken away from her. Don't miss that. He says, she'll never lose it. What she has chosen, she will never lose it. There's an eternal implication there, but there's also a very present implication. She's like, Mary's not going to get up and go to the kitchen. Even if maybe she should, even if that would be a good thing, she's not going to get up because she is saying right now, I'm going to focus on what is important, and I don't care what's going on around me. I don't care if people think, shouldn't you go help Martha? I don't care if if I'm feeling a little bit of guilt about choosing what is important because I'm fixed on Jesus. I'm going to put my mind on him, and I'm not going to let anything else rob me of my focus. It's not just about what we get. We have to think about what we might lose. Amen? Amen. Maybe you'll come and say, you know what? I hope I get that promotion. I hope I get that job. I hope I take that next step up. And you don't think about the fact that you might lose your family in the process. You might lose precious time with your children. You might lose something that is so much more important. Maybe you feel like, you know, I'm going to get a little sense of self-righteousness. I'm going to get a little sense of, look, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, in my political ideologies and all these things. Look what I'm going to get when I say this, when I post this, when I do this, and you don't realize you are losing your witness with the people in your life who need to know Jesus. And they're just going to roll their eyes at you every time you start to bring up the gospel because of the things you have said and the ways that you have behaved over time. Nobody likes this. No one's going to say amen, but that's fine. We'll keep going. Maybe you're like, I got to get the dream house. I got to get the dream car. I got to get this thing that I want because then people will look at me a certain way and then I will have arrived. But you don't think maybe you lose your ability, your capacity to be radically generous And where once you were a person who was just looking for who can I help and what can I give to and how can I be generous in this world, now you got something that you wanted, but you are not able to be generous anymore. And Jesus is like, there's only one thing that's important. There's only one thing that's important. Focus on what is important. Hey, maybe... You get the relationship that you're wanting. You get the guy, you get the girl that you've been hoping for, praying for, but it requires you to compromise your faith to the point that you begin losing your relationship with Christ. And you've got to ask. It's not about what you get. You have to consider what might you lose. Today, Lord, we pray that we would have the ability to choose what is most important. 
Choose what matters most. Choose what is most important. Finally, we trust God's plan. How do we choose the best? We just trust God's plan. Remember in Matthew 6.31, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about where you're going to go or what you're going to do. Like, don't worry about all these things because everybody's worried about those things. And then he says something so important that we can miss. He says, your father already knows what you need. He's not saying like, hey, just don't have any cares in this world and live a carefree, careless life. He's saying God knows what you need. He's able to take care of you. He wants you to experience his goodness in the land of the living. You can trust him. And because you can trust him to help, and because you can trust him to be with you, and because you can trust him to take care of you, you are able to choose his priorities before your own, knowing that he loves you. And so we set our goals formed by God's agenda and his will. That's how we set our goals. That's how we set the goals for our life. We don't ask God to bless our plan but to bless our alignment to his plan. Anybody ever been there? So distracted, so pulled in so many different directions that you're like, God, here's what I'm going to do, but I need your help to do this, even though you're so far from what God is calling you to do. We trust God to meet our needs and our desires. We trust God to meet our needs and our desires. Put them first. That's what it means to be single-minded. A simple exercise for you at the end of every day. You can do it today. It'll be even better if you do it tomorrow because tomorrow's Monday. That's the real world, right? (laughs) At the end of the day, before you go to sleep, take a moment, put your phone away, maybe. Put your phone away, take a moment and ask yourself, "If, if a stranger were with me every moment of this day. If they followed me around, if they were with me in private, if they were with me in public, if they were next to me all day long, what would this stranger say matters most to me? What would this person say is the most important thing in my life? It's a genuine question and I think you would discover, again, that I'm not coming at you with with judgment or harshness. I think you would discover, you know what, the moment I wake up, I check my phone and I sit there for about 30 minutes. And then when I get a little bit of extra time, when I could pray, when I could do whatever, you know what I do? I get back on my phone or I go after something else or I turn on the TV. And when I get home, the first thing I do is I just try to entertain myself so I don't have to think about anything. And so I can just numb all my feelings and my stresses and all these things. Or I turn to alcohol or I turn to this. Like you might find that you are pulled in so many directions. And while we might be people who say that God is the most important thing in our life, the most important person in our life, the most important relationship in our life, while we might say it, we'll find that our lives don't show it. We'll find that our lives don't show it. We pray this prayer together. God, show me what is the most important thing and help me to live with all my focus and all my attention on that. Amen? Let's pray together to that end today. Jesus, we come to you and we ask God that you would reveal to us the things in our lives that are most important, that are most valuable, the things that you value most. Forgive us for the places, God, where we've been distracted. Forgive us for the moments where our attention has gone so many different directions and help us, Lord, to focus on you. Spirit of God, speak to us now, all across this room, speak to us now. I pray that you would drop that wisdom in our hearts. What do we need to eliminate? What distraction is keeping us from you? What are we choosing over you and your priorities in our life? Spirit of God, show us now.
And Holy Spirit, even as you have opened our hearts and even as you have revealed to us where we need to change and where we need to repent, we pray today that you would give us the strength to do so. That you would give us the strength to do so. We remember the words of Jesus who showed us how to live. Jesus who said that his very food was to do the will of his Father. May that be food for us. May that be life for us. May that be thriving for us to do your will. To see as important what you count as important. Strengthen us to this end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm actually going to close out the message right here because I want you to rest in what you've just heard from the Lord. I believe that God has spoken to you. I believe that there are some things that God has put on your heart to walk out of here with. I hope you'll have genuine conversations with the people you love, not argue with them, not fight with them, not like, you see what he said? You got to put your phone away. Like, that's not what we're looking for today at lunch. We're looking for genuine, heartfelt conversations. Where's the Lord leading you? How is the Lord leading you? As you live for him, you will discover everything you are searching for. Inner peace, inner peace, joy, love, thriving, flourishing. I fundamentally believe that because I have known that in my own life and I want that for you too, amen? So let's stand to our feet. Let me pray this blessing over you and you go out and you take on the world in the name of Jesus for the glory of God as a healthy, flourishing, thriving person living in his presence every day.